I always think of having a big fire and putting around the fire people from all around the world. Young, old, students, scientists, writers, artists. The first thing that happens, there's this very long silence. Fire is innate to us. It's been with us for thousands of years. It has been our protection, our food. The moment you see fire, you recognize something that is inside of you long before you were born. With fire, you have to be very silent. It's just looking at it and understanding it. The only way to embrace fire and cooking with fire is through silence. It's very fragile fire. My first memory of him was 40 years ago when I was nine. And Francis had a restaurant one block away. But it was a, like a fancy place. I, I remember the height of the tables because I was small. I remember the height of the ceilings. And I remember that he was very tall and like a sort of a prince, charming quality in him. I started my first restaurant when I was 18. When I think about those days and the menus I did, they were very ambitious already. All things that didn't exist in our country, things that I, I wanted to know what they were, but they were unavailable. That restaurant, it would open only in summer and in winter. So I did my first trip to Paris on my own. I realized that there was an incredible world in France of history, of culture, of roots. And then I, I thought, I have to move to Paris. And I stayed in France for a long time. I learned a lot from them. I was reproducing everything I had learned from the masters of French cooking. Most of the chefs for whom I worked had won the Grand Prix de l'Art de la Cuisine. And in 1995, they announced in Europe that that year I was getting the prize. Obviously, there was a joy inside of me. But at the same time, I remember I was very sad next morning. I didn't know why. So I remember I went to Barcelona for two, three days on my own. And I walked and I cried and I laughed. I realized that I didn't have my own voice. 
I was still singing a song of another musician. It wasn't mine. I decided to start composing my music and my recipes. And I thought that the only thing I had to do was to kneel down and pick up all the remembrances of my youth, of my childhood. It was very strong inside of me. I had forgotten it completely. I had forgotten the fires of home. I had forgotten the fires in the mountains where we cooked. Forgotten the fires in the lakes. I thought, well, I can't go all my life like this, being a French chef, being born in South America. So slowly, I went into that pot, which is the culture, the idiosyncrasy of Argentina in cooking. Which is a mix of, basically, of dreams and poverty. A lot of things were happening in the 90s. The beginning of a new Argentinian food and a new pride. We started being proud of our, our food and our traditions. but we, we opened our minds. But at some point, we started using fire. And that changed everything. I was invited to cook in a castle in Germany. And they said, you can do whatever you want. And I said, well, I will do a tribute to potatoes. We cooked 12 recipes of potatoes. In each dish, the potato was the main guest. And then you had something little on the side. Maybe it was a shrimp, or you had a riz de veau, which is a sweet bread, or you had a little steak. But the main thing was a potato. The maître d'hôtel of the restaurant said to me, sir, would you like to come and choose the linens and the silverware for the dinner? And I said, well, no, just put one beautiful white cloth. And in the middle of that long table, I put 400 kilos of dirty potatoes on the linen. So the dirt was there. The presence of the earth was there. The presence of South America, of the Andes. Potato defines uh, Latin American cooking. Argentinians eat potato every day. Come to my house, 
midday, smashed potatoes. And maybe at night you can have uh, baked potatoes or fried potatoes. Everything has potato. I think Francis and the potatoes are like a marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I remember once I cooked for Ronnie Wood, one of the Rolling Stones in the beach in Uruguay. And I thought, you know, I had his reservation and I thought, this man who inspired my childhood, I'm gonna put a low grill in the sand and I'm gonna cook for him right there, kneeling all night in silence because all, all the happiness he brought me. I'm not religious at all but kneeling is a thing that it's related to respect. And that's why I'm kneeling today too. Ronnie, we love your music. Estas nevadas, ¿no? Me dan mucha alegría. Las nevadas así se quitan. Sí. Ah, qué chocho caminando por el bosque. Sí. Cómo han cambiado los viajes acá, ¿no? Porque te acuerdas lo que eran los primeros viajes. Yo me acuerdo de esa época que veníamos con esos gomones que nos pasaba el agua por arriba, sí. que se nos congelaba el agua acá en el pecho y llegábamos al fondo con una capa de hielo. Increíble. En 1987, we began the first cabin in the island. And I was always dreaming of being a pioneer, you know, imagining those times when they came here and there was nobody, and suddenly we had discovered a lake with no inhabitant. Francis came first, and he came back and told us, I found a place that's unbelievable. I was the one that built the first cabin there, and I began working with Francis at that time. One of the kids who works here in a very heavy storm, he dropped the barge on top of the rocks. So if we didn't take it out, it would have stayed there all summer. We really need it. I went to the kitchen and I said, well, why don't we try and between all of us to push it out? It's an incredible group of people, you know? They all work in this for years. We travel all around the world cooking and doing things, and sometimes it's happiness and sometimes it's sadness and hard work. They're fast, they are involved. They're not shy about waiting who, to see who carries what. They just carry things. Everybody knows what they have to do. It's beautiful to see it. I've, it makes me very proud to see the team working like that. Nos conocimos, yo comencé trabajando de camarero en 1884, que es el restaurante que está en Bodegas Corihuela, en Mendoza. De a poquito terminé entrando a la cocina y, y descubriendo un poco el oficio. Van como unos 20 años con Francis. Francis ha sido un maestro en mi vida, ha sido una especie de gurú. Y el que he aprendido, bueno, he aprendido de la cocina, mi oficio, y, y muchas cosas de la vida. 
pero una cosa es levantarlo y ahí le metemos tronco, como hacían los egipcios para mover las gigantes piedras. Lo levantamos, le metemos los troncos abajo y ahí lo, lo volvemos a apoyar y empezamos a arrastrarlo para atrás. Lo conozco a Francia hace unos 12 años. Yo estudiaba en un colegio de gastronomía y nos mandaron a hacer pasantías al pueblo Garzón, en Uruguay. Y ahí, trabajando en planchas, entre planchas, conocí a Francis. La primera vez que vine aquí al Lago La Plata, me ofrecí como voluntario. Y le dije, muchas gracias, Francis, por traerme y elegirme. Me dijo, yo sabía que te iba a gustar. Una, dos y tres. Yo vivo acá durante todo el año. Hacíamos temporada de invierno, temporada de verano. Y se fue ampliando más la, la hostería. Y bueno, el momento en el que nos terminamos quedando todo el año. Yo acá en la isla, mi trabajo es solucionar todos los días los problemas que se, se presentan. Es una familia, aparte de trabajar en equipos, porque todos necesitamos de, de alguien. Y bueno, el compañerismo creo que es lo principal en, en ese trabajo de equipo. Creo que no existe un tiempo libre en la, en la isla. Mi familia, bien, los nenes son chicos y que todavía es fácil. Mi mamá también trabaja, es parte del equipo. ¿Usted dice que no van a salir ricas las empanadas o no? Riquísimas. <risa> So this is the shoulder, the back of the animal here, and it's very delicious part. Here we go. Okay. I think we will have to stop all this sort of farming of beasts that, you know, they are raised in antibiotics, anabolics, and whatnot. Like in the cage, they don't move, they just eat grains and they're shot constantly so they don't get sick. That's very sad. So I think the future of meat is less meat of more quality. We have the best grasslands in Las Pampas to make the most incredible beef, but we have to not be greedy and forget doing the horrible things we do to these animals. perfect steak. It's always a mystery when you do a steak. Every time I cook a delicious piece of meat, I have doubts. After 50 years, you know, I look at it and I say, well, you know, I have to be here. I have to look at it constantly and see what's happening. The meat label may be like the meat chef. But he's not the meat chef. He's the Argentinian chef. Or the fire chef. Or the outdoors chef. If you're a cook and you want to learn something from him, crust. The crust that he gets with the chapas and the fire and the cast iron. Let's take all the philosophy and the deep learning from life that you may get from him. That relationship from heat 
iron transmission to food and evaporation and crust. It's really hard. <laughs> Sometimes you get it by chance and you get really happy. You're at home and you take some potatoes out of the oven and you find like four or five that are perfect. Well, he does that with every single potato. So that's kind of hard. I feel that Francis is our ambassador, our chef ambassador, because he knew our kitchen from the heart and he translated to plates and recreate atmosphere in all the, the events he do around the world. I think Francis is unique. He doesn't give a shit about the rest. I mean, he does what he wants to do and he does it first and he does it better. He's like a person that teach you many things, not only a recipe or a way to cook. When I met him, being in his group or in his life, it was like a huge open studio, open heart, many things. I, I, I knew that I would learn more than in any other kitchen. If I have to have a class with Francis, I will do it twice. One, I will see what he's doing. The second time, I will close my eyes and listen to him. Young people, when he speaks, they get mesmerized because there's truth there. For me, having uh, Francis as a teacher, it was spiritual. The recipes, the techniques, all these things with her things hanging, it's amazing, it's unique, but when you listen to him, you are listening to a visionary. It doesn't matter if he's a cook or if he's a poet. So we're going to cook it for four hours like this. It's a craft of all the details of tying, learning about fires, and reading what's happening under this place. Be careful. Fire is something very beautiful, but we have to be very, very respectful. He's just a guy sitting on a rock with a dog and a fire. And you see that as the epitome of sophistication. And that's really hard to do. But he makes it so easy. ¿Vos querés armar el fueguito acá? Ahí sí. sí. Y meterle un fósforo abajo. Trae una chiquitita. Esta está seca. Esta está buenísima. Está costando, ¿eh? Está buenísimo. We lived in a house that everything was with fires. So when we were children, we were sort of part of that. Much better than being in an office. I thought our grandmother was really good in transforming leftovers, remember? I agree She with never that. threw anything, and all the leftovers, she did another meal. And you never knew, you couldn't find out what she had used, because it looked like a new meal, but it, they were all leftovers. <laughs> yeah. After lunch, Tata, our grandmother, would sit by the fire with a book 
right in front of the chimney reading. Yeah. And she fell asleep with the book on her hands. Yeah. And the book would just fall on her and she would sleep a siesta right by the fire there. I remember that. You remember the, the lady who cooked? She was yes. quite good. I remember her tortillas. Yes, you do. I, yeah, they were unbelievable. And I always remember them and I always tried to make something similar and I never could until I saw you yesterday yeah. cooking the tortilla here. And I remember our grandfather, Papapa, that he came with a gun. He killed the snake. A snake, yeah, with a gun. Uh, he was quite know. crazy. Yeah. Papapa, no? Yeah. But he always had the gun in his table. Gun and chocolate. Gun and chocolate. Yeah. And he went to, to I think he went to the casino. He too. went to the casino because <laughs> he loved to go to Monte Carlo and he would get to Paris and rent a convertible car. Yeah, he was and very And put nice. his necktie and drive all the way to Monte Carlo. Our grandfather was quite a character. He had a big house by the river and he had a very mysterious room, you remember? Yeah. If you went into his wardrobe, which was like, you know, on the wall, there was a little door. And you opened the door and you went up a little stairway to a bedroom. A stair that went, that made a turn on its way. Yeah. But it was like a tunnel, very, very dark. And you got to another small bedroom. And I think it was for his lovers. <laughs> for no? his lovers, yes, <laughs> for sure. Other times. Other times, yeah. We had the luck of being brought up in, in a wonderful natural place as Bariloche in the middle of the Andes. Moments like this are so unique and there aren't many moments like this in normal life. You have to seek them in nature. Being in nature is silence. In the mountains or in these forests. It's wonderful to discover the deepness of silence. We shared this experience with the mountains, with the forest, with the Andean nature. And I think that's something very, very strong in each of us and that unites us. So, for lunchtime, uh, I brought something to make a tribute to our father. The Adagietto of Mahler Fifth Symphony. Oh, he yes. loved that. No? I remember. That's a nice memory of our father and going into his office with Mahler. And he could stay there hours and hours. Yeah. My essence is quite a light since I'm 10 years old. I realized then that, you know, that I was an individual and that many people around me had dreams for my own life. And I think that they wanted good things for me, but not what I wanted. I think the big change came with music. The only thing we had in Patagonia when I was a kid was a radio. Suddenly, there was this beautiful revolution of the flower children, singers and bands, and that was something very, very strong inside of me. It just caught me, you know? Wow. 
When Francis was in secondary school, he came home one day and told my father that school wasn't for him. That it was completely boring and that he wasn't going to go on, that he wanted to go to California to sing. And that's what he did. <laughs> he left school and went to sing California. Francis was a rebel since a young boy. The strength that Francis had was they couldn't do anything to stop him, so it was better for him to do what he really wanted. And I think that that was a very clever thing of my father at that time. My father had changed a lot already by that time. He was very strict with me, and then I think that he realized that strictness wasn't the way, you know? And uh, with Francis, I think that he learned that uh, he had to be able to accept things as they were and that everybody was different. Los eventos con Francis, él puede hacer una carne ocho, nueve, diez horas colgada. A veces ni nos fijamos si es para mil personas o para dos mil o para tres mil. Este, y estás toda la noche cocinando con fuego, humo. Y si es de día, con el sol, si es verano, te va a castigar. El único y otro se me ha desmayado. Y lo he sacado de ahí dentro de los fuegos. Algo que me encanta de, de, de él en cuanto a la toma de decisiones es que siempre te pide tu opinión. Siempre te dice, ¿y vos qué pensás sobre este tema? Esa es parte para mí de su gran generosidad. Yo admiro mucho su, su creatividad. Es muy creativo, como él crea todo, o sea, no solamente una receta, crea eh, mesas hermosas, crea casas, crea equipos de trabajo, crea eh, momentos, es como un gran creador. Lo de hacernos compartir horas y horas de vida nos ha hecho un poco acercarnos o tener, un, eh, tener una, por ahí cierta, un diálogo a veces implícito, que a veces no hace falta hablar, es una intuición. Y eso nos ha ido un poco, creo que nos une a la hora de trabajar. Y entonces es difícil imaginarme trabajando lejos de él. Me, y además porque el estilo de trabajo que llevo con él eh, no, no, no es fácil y casi que me, me animo a decir eh, prácticamente imposible encontrarlo en otro lugar. Cocinar con amor, en cocinar siendo compañeros. Lo más importante es eh, disfrutarlo en bailando, escuchando alguna, alguna canción, eh, riendo, contando anécdotas. Eso es lo más lindo de este equipo, el equipo de fuegos. Ya hace 11 años que estoy trabajando con Francis, así que he decidido ir a probar a otro lado con mi familia, dejar un poco la Argentina. Lo hablé con Francis, me súper apoyó, obviamente.
también me dijo que tiene todo su respaldo, de que si pruebo me va mal, que siempre me va a estar esperando. Y, este, bueno. También dejarle el, el lugar a otro que pueda vivir esta increíble experiencia. Y bueno, este, siempre me dijo, eh, no te preocupes que nos vamos a encontrar en algún lugar, en algún evento, entre fuegos, para volver a cocinar juntos. Eso fue lo muy lindo. Me dijo, este, obviamente, dejó a mis hermanos cocineros, dejó como una familia aquí en los fuegos. Pero por allá sé que siempre me van a recordar cuando hagan el domo, se quemen hasta las patas cuando yo no estoy. José es alguien que tengo una relación, que lo quiero, que, que tengo un afecto especial. No voy a encontrar otra persona igual. Eh, no. José es un hermano. Es difícil. Es raro. Voy a extrañar. Eso, mucho. Ah. Francis nos trata como compañero de trabajo muchas veces. Y bueno, yo le dije que, que conmigo se le puede ir ese miedo porque vamos, vamos a ir juntos, le voy a hacer la aguanta hasta que, hasta que decía, le había comentado a Francis que me iba a quedar con él trabajando hasta que sean los últimos días de él, así que creo que voy a estar acá. I believe that sewing, it's a bit like cooking. You know, when you're doing something with your hands, you're concentrated on it. But at the same time, your mind is free to think. But it thinks in a different way when you're sewing or when you're cutting or when you're cooking. It's not that you're completely devoted to it, but there are two things happening. Your hands are doing something and your mind comes and goes between thoughts. Sewing carries the pace of living. Each stitch makes you think of the beauty of patience, the beauty of equality, of things that can be sewn together. When you grow up, everything hurts you. When I was young, I had these pair of jeans that they, were, they had hundreds of patches over the years and I loved them so much until they sort of rot. And I used lots of colors and different textiles to patch them. And they were like a language of my life. I felt that the patches were a bit like all the, the things that hurted me and I had to patch them with flowers. And so it was a, it was a way expressing myself uh, in my silence.
I'm not very good, you know, but I I can do some things. I do hats for my children. I fix all their clothes when they need it. They always bring me a bag of things to to fix. Or when we travel together around the world with them, they always bring things in the hotels. We sit down and I sew and they talk and we listen to music. I have seven children and they all have been baptized here at four months old. They come from four different mothers, but they are great friends, you know. And for the first ones, it was quite suffering because in those days I had very small boats and the waves would go over us and wet us and they would cry. They all love the island because it's nice to be together. You know, when they're home, always the first morning. When they wake up, I wait till the last moment to make the toast so they're hot, the egg, and I serve them these oeufs à la coque, like in Paris. And the second day I do them again, and the third day, they start with their celery juice in the morning, and they, they want me to drink it, and I try to drink it, but I don't like it. Ah, what a beauty! I find that young people nowadays, they have ambitions of doing beautiful things for the planet, because the planet needs it, and we all need it. The planet is sort of destroyed because we were taught, my generation, and further down a bit, to, to, to collect things, you know, to have houses and to make every day our, our farm a little bit bigger. So I have a fight inside of me of how I'm gonna go on with my, my career, you know? Yeah. We, we started changing many things in the restaurants, not using any more farmed fish, trying to really trace down the origins of meat. My daughters have become vegans in the last few years. And that took me to make a recipe that will make happy everyone. Delicious plancha of many vegetables that we will cook slowly, slowly, slowly. We turn them and turn them and turn them. It's like a feeling of, of having a, like a ball of vegetables that rolls on my plancha. They always wrote to me, the young vegan, saying, Chef, we love your work. We don't eat meat, but we still like what you do with the fires. And after getting hundreds and hundreds of messages like that, I thought, well, I have to do something for them. So I decided to do a vegetarian vegan book for them. Estuvimos involucradas en el proyecto del libro Green Fires y para mí fue, en lo personal, fue de los proyectos que más disfruté de, de, del trabajo con Francis. Y es muy, es muy lindo que haya escuchado esa comunidad joven que lo sigue y que, y que está dispuesto a, a, a seguir eh, consumiendo Francis Malman, pero desde otro lugar. Me parece como muy lindo que haya, que haya ido por ese lado. Francis change, no? Every person change. I think he's in the most human moment ever. From Francis, I learned not to be afraid of changes. He was very criticized when he started doing this. But now everybody's doing it. I think that some people do it for a trend, and they do it because, okay, this is the right thing to do right now because it's gonna be good for business. 
and it's gonna be good for my PR. And I think he does that because he actually looking for something there. Todos los cocineros están haciendo un giro porque es como como es que el mundo sustentable va hacia eso. El tema es el tiempo. Bast me parece bastante disruptivo para él siendo el rey del fuego y, y del asado, quizás. Eh, tener, tener un libro vegetariano vegano me parece un, un gran paso. I love teaching. I've been teaching all my life. I'm more into a more introspective part of my life now. My mother loved flowers. And since we were kids, she was always doing flowers in our house. They bring joy. They bring hope flowers, always. I think it reminds us as well of the beauty of, of living and dying. They die very elegantly. I would like to die like that too. It will come one day. Yeah. Life prepares us to die. You know, you don't, you don't feel it until you're sort of 50. But as you grow older, you understand it more and you, you, you sort of can embrace it in a way. Creo que no es solamente un jefe, ¿no? Siempre invitarnos a, a su mesa es ser parte de su familia, ¿ya, ¿no? No le cuesta nada. Me parece que lo que lo hace es, es su fuego interno, es esta lucecita de la cual él siempre habla de niño. Es una persona muy conectada con él mismo y con el universo. Entonces, viene de ahí un poco, ¿no? Cuando uno está alineado con, con lo que vino a hacer este, a este mundo, las cosas fluyen y la energía está disponible. Con Francis. Uf, me llevo mucho amor, muchas anécdotas, muchas experiencias tormentas, fuegos apagados, eh, fuegos de nuevo prendidos, eventos atrasados, pero sobre todo mucha felicidad de la gente de lo que hemos cocinado muy bien. Francis changed the course of Argentinian food. You have to give and to receive. He's receiving. La cocina le está devolviendo todo lo que él dio.
Well, the beauty of fire is like a human life. They're both very alike. It goes up and down, it's happy, it's sad, it goes off. It starts again, when you're hurt, when you're healed. And fire is exactly the same. It's such a symbol for humans. Fire is innate to us. It's been with us for thousands of years. It has been our protection, our food, so many things. It's the collective aura of a human settlement on Earth. Fire, it can be a hymn of silence. It can be a song of an angel. It can be the shout of a brutal man living in the mountains. When you start to learn about it and really look into and understand it, you see what happens to it when it goes from huge flames to beautiful red coals and ashes. Fire gloriously lives at the edge of uncertainty and time.